season. Yeah, I, I might start a little bit early. I have questions. You have questions? <laughs> Great. Okay. I'll start at half past then, eh? Yeah. Yeah. Testing one, two. All good. Great. AV works during mini comps. I mean, this is this is way too organised. Yeah, it's like just yeah, just that. like break it and like maybe if we could just like you know have microphones not work, and maybe a projector explode, and uh, you know. I was impressed the projectors even push the right resolution. See, that's just that's just not right. <laughs> I'm just pleased that I don't have to like reboot the whole laptop because I'm on FreeBSD. No, no, this is FreeBSD, so um, oh, you know, sus <laughs> suspend resume even works these days, which is pretty awesome. Yeah. How did you do that without messaging? <laughs> it's taken us a long time. It's an extra 15 years. Yeah, yeah just about. Hmm. Okay. Well, AV works too well, uh, and the projector works too well. And this is distinctly un mini comp like because we're also on time. Uh, <laughs> Even more un mini comp like In, in, in <laughs> mini -like. So uh, maybe a volcano will erupt and we'll be stuck here for, for three months. It's happened uh, at one comp that sells out. But uh, yes, Fraser, welcome. Thank you. Thanks, Stuart. So hi, yes, I'm Fraser. Um, this is a talk about property-based testing. So I'm a developer at Red Hat, where I work on the free IPA identity management system and the dog tag certificate authority. At work, I'm mainly using Python and Java, uh, but in the real world, mainly Haskell. Uh, so I have a lot of Haskell side projects, and I'm really into Haskell, which is why I'm wearing this shirt. So I'm going to introduce property-based testing and motivate it with some examples. Concepts will primarily be demonstrated in Haskell, but hopefully um, the examples are straightforward and comprehensible, even if you're uh, not already familiar with Haskell. We will have a brief look at property-based testing in other languages, and I'll conclude with a discussion of the limitations of property-based testing and a look at some alternative approaches. So property-based testing uh, is a testing paradigm um, where you state uh, algebraic properties of uh, functions or data structures. A property-based testing framework will give you uh, a way to declare how to generate random data of your types and typically they will um, provide a library of these generators for uh, types in the standard library of the language. And finally, when you run these tests, uh, the framework will generate lots of random data and uh, see if those properties hold. So you will attempt to falsify those properties and should it succeed, it will report counterexamples. And the good property-based testing frameworks, uh, upon finding a counterexample, will also try and uh, simplify those examples to get, to get you a minimal uh, counterexample that falsifies the property. So this is great for checking laws and invariants of functions, algorithms, uh, data structures, and abstractions that you're using in your code. And these exist uh, for basically anything worth its salt in programming. As the programmer, uh, all you have to do is find out or work out what these laws uh, or invariants are, write them down, and if you write them down uh, in the um, correct way, uh, those are your tests. Um, you're pretty much done. It's great for checking code against a model implementation. So if you have um, your function my fancy sort, that's intended to sort a list. Um, maybe it has some particular time complexity um, 
properties that are different from the standard library sort. It's very easy to state a property that says that the behaviour of my fancy sort is the same as standard library sort, and the framework can then check that. And finally, properties are uh, meaningful documentation. Uh, users of your, um, of your functions or your libraries uh, will appreciate you stating um, what these properties are. Um, a type is good, but often a type um, is not enough to fully specify the behaviour of a function. However, stating properties that uh, hold for the function is something that uh, downstream developers can take. Um, they can reason about your code and how your code interacts with, um, with their code. Or to put it another way, um, properties uh, can be composed and uh, people can construct um, logical theorems uh, about their code where they're using these um, functions that you've provided where you've specified these properties. So they're meaningful documentation um, and that just happens to be machine checkable. So um, we'll start with some examples and I'll just switch over to my editor. So um, this is a Haskell module uh, we, where we are going to test um, a list reverse function. So this function here, rev, has the type list of A to list of A for any type A. And um, it's an inductively or a uh, recursively defined data type, so this is its implementation. The empty list reversed is the empty list. And uh, if it's a non-empty list, so a cons list, x con x's, um, then we reverse the tail of the list and then append to that the singleton list containing the thing that was on the front. Now the type list A to list A has many possible implementations. So we can state two additional properties that uh, uniquely characterize list reversal. The first one is prop rev unit, which is parameterized over one value. In this case, we have to concretely specify the type so the compiler knows which random generator to use. But you could equally put string or float or something else there. The property itself, prop rev unit with a single parameter x, which corresponds to this int, um, is defined as the equality of the reverse of the singleton list containing x being equal to the singleton list containing x. In other words, the reverse of a single element list is the same list. The second property is parameterized over two arbitrary lists which we introduce as x's and y's. And this property is the equality of the reverse of x's and y's appended together to the reverse of x's prepended to the reverse, sorry, the reverse of y's prepended to the reverse of x's. So does that make sense to everyone? If you, if you have two lists, the reverse of the two lists being appended is the same as reversing this one and reversing that one and putting them the other way around. So in, in the um, Haskell uh, REPL now, GHCI, we can simply call quick check prop uh, rev, uh, typo that, rev unit. Right, that's going to generate 100 random integer x's and check that the property holds for each of those. And uh, we see in this case past 100 tests, 100 is the default, but that's um, um, tweakable. And uh, similarly for rev append, it's going to generate 100 random sets of arbitrary lists, x's and y's, and check that the property um, rev append holds for each of those pairs, um, and indeed it does. So another example, um, this one is a little more involved. Um, it's an expression transformation. So we have here a very simple uh, expression type. It's a sum type containing literal integers or an add value with two sub-expressions or a mul, a multiplication value containing two sub-expressions. We can define a function elimmul1 which simplifies the expression by removing cases where something is multiplied with the literal 1, uh, 1 being the multiplicative identity 
um, that's a simplification that you can perform on an expression. So we'll write a function to do this. Um, if it's a literal x, um, the function is defined as just that same literal x. If it's an add expression, um, the result is um, another add expression, but we perform the elimination on both of the sub-expressions. If it's a multiplication, if, the, if either of the sub-expressions is the literal one, um, then we simplify the expression and the result is whatever the other branch was with the elimination um, having been called on that. And finally, if it's a mull without um, the literal one in either branch, then we just return a mull with um, the elimination being done on each of the branches. Now, if we state the property elim mull one elim, so um, we're going to assert here that the function elim mull one does actually eliminate these cases from the expression. Um, it's parameterized over an arbitrary expression and it's defined as false if the literal one appears uh, in a mull expression on either branch. Um, or if it's a mull without a lit one, we just have to assert that um, the property is false on both of the sub-expressions. Uh, likewise for an add, and if it's a literal value, the uh, property holds. So if we uh, call quick check on this property, a limb, mul one, a limb. Hmm. What have I done? Ah, oh, yes. Proper limb, mul one, a limb. Um, we've got a problem. There's no instance of arbitrary for the expression type. Um, so this is the mechanism by which we declare how to generate random values um, of the type extra. So I'll just code this very quickly. Um, it'll be uh, sized gen when gen zero. So we use the size function to make sure that we don't build an infinite um, tree here. Um, you can build infinite data structures in Haskell, but they, they tend to be quite difficult to test. <laughs> so if it's gen zero, then it'll be uh, one of either an arbitrary literal or the pure literal one, just to make sure that we have a reasonable number of the literal one throughout our tree. And if it's a gen n, then let n prime equal give n2 in one of. Again, we can have a uh, arbitrary literal or we can have uh, an add value with two arbitrary sub-expressions. And likewise, uh, we can have a mal value with two arbitrary sub-expressions. Now we can reload this, um, call quick check on our property. And this time it runs, um, but there's a problem. There's actually a subtle bug in my implementation. Um, specifically, the problem is that when you have um, a mul with two literal ones inside another mul, the inner mul is simplified, but then the outer mul doesn't check that both of its um, branches, uh, or both of its sub-expressions aren't the literal one after doing the recursive call on each of its branches. So um, some of you may have picked up that this bug was present in the implementation. Um, some of you may not have. Um, if you were going to be writing example-based tests for this function, as a programmer, you would have to have been clever enough to realize that this corner case exists and, tests for, and test for it. Um, but with property-based testing, as a developer, you are relieved of this burden. And that's a very good thing. Um, so most languages have at least one implementation of property-based testing. Um, there is an incomplete list on Wikipedia um, with the link up there. Um, but there are some decent or popular implementations uh, missing from that list, including one called Pixie for Python, uh, which I'll show on the next slide, and also the functional Java test module. 
So for the Python example, um, again, we're just looking at the um, list reverse example for the sake of familiarity. So there's this QC, quick check um, decorator, and the statements of um, properties are, um, well, obviously the, the syntax is Python, but conceptually it's very similar. Um, you uh, state the types, or in the case of Python, you have to explicitly specify the generator for integers. And in the body of the function, you just assert the equality. And um, similarly for rev append, uh, except this time we specify a generator for a list of int. And then if we run this test, um, prop rev unit, pass 100 tests, and uh, yeah, this one's a bit slower. But you can see that um, prop rev append um, also passed. So we have a high degree of confidence that the implementation of rev is correct. <coughs> so some of the limitations of property-based testing. Um, if we consider um, password hashing and verification. So here we have um, prop verify EQ, which states that if you verify the password S against the hash of S, that that should be true. Okay, that makes sense. For prop verify not equal, given two passwords, S and S prime, with the precondition that those passwords are unequal, then verifying S prime against the hash of S must be false. Now this is a perfectly uh, sensible algebraic property. However, what if there's a bug in the hash function and it truncates its input to say eight characters before it does the hashing? Well, uh, the problem with that is with two random values, S and S prime, um, you're very unlikely to get two random values with a long common prefix. So you're very unlikely to trigger this sort of bug with random values. Um, and there are many kinds of bugs like this. So in some cases, random data isn't enough. You do actually need to be um, a little bit clever and fuzz the data or mutate it in domain-specific ways um, in order to hit the particular corner cases uh, that could be present in whatever sort of code it is you're writing. Of course, this relies on the uh, developer cleverness, so it's not ideal. Um, but yeah, in some cases, the purely random testing is, uh, is not quite enough. So to resolve the problem in Haskell, you might write a function fuzz, which takes a password and returns a generator of new passwords containing um, or generating random truncations, extensions, permutations, and so on. And um, then you can state a new property, prop verify fuzzed, that takes one password and returns a property, and then explicitly uses this generator, fuzz s, to verify the not equal property. Arbitrary, and its uh, analogs in other property based testing frameworks and other languages, uh, are great for generating random data. Um, sorry, random valid data, but uh, what happens when you need to uh, specify and test the behaviour of your functions under invalid data? Um, in that case, I recommend just using a, just an example-based test. So in this case, it's hspec, but you know, it could be pi unit or uh, rspec or whatever. So we can describe load fails on bogus input and uh, load a bogus string if it's JSON we're dealing with, and uh, should be nothing. But there's still useful properties we can test in this case, and that's that if we do a round trip um, of dumping a value A, an arbitrary value A, and then loading it back in, we should get back the original value. So in conclusion, property-based testing is true automated testing. Um, it gives you more thorough testing in less time, which means less money, and it relieves the developers of the burden of um, having to be clever and uh, or knowing about the corner cases and manually writing tests for those. 
Properties are also meaningful documentation that just happens to be machine checkable. So the best test data is random test data, but sometimes a bit of domain-specific non-randomness uh, is needed, and example-based testing still has its place. Now, a brief look at some alternative approaches. Um, exhaustive testing is one, which says that the best test data is all of the data. Um, so what that will do is, um, well, it'll generate all the data or all the data up to a, a given size or depth and check that the property holds in every case. Um, this supports existential properties. So instead of saying, you know, for all X this property holds, you can say there exists some X for which this property holds. And that can sometimes be useful. And uh, exhaustive testing is available in several languages. And finally, proof. Um, the best test data is no test data. So some languages have theorem-proving capabilities. Uh, in these systems, your properties become theorems, and uh, if you don't provide a proof for those theorems, you don't have a program. Uh, typically, it's a compiler error. Um, these also support extraction to mainstream languages like OCaml and Haskell, and also um, Java and JavaScript and uh, C in the case of Idris. And I will uh, show you a quick example in Idris now. So uh, again, we're going to look at the list reversal um, function. So hopefully that's fairly familiar now. Um, the syntax is also reasonably similar to Haskell. So we have the definition of rev here. We have our rev unit um, equality type. So the type is actually an equality here. And the implementation is a reflexivity tactic that, given the definition of rev, can deduce that this equality holds. That the reverse of the list, uh, the singleton list A is the singleton, singleton list um, containing um, A. And for reverse append, um, this is a little more involved, and we introduce a meta variable here. Um, if we fire this up in the Idris REPL, okay. Um, so you can see that we have an undefined meta variable here, proof rev app. So we can enter an interactive proof mode. Um, prove, proof, rev app. Okay, so we use intros to move all of the uh, variables and assumptions into the proof context here. <coughs> and um, this down the bottom is our proof goal. So we can uh, perform induction on X's. Um, we use the compute tactic to simplify the goal. And then we can uh, rewrite the goal using a theorem already provided in the standard library um, about um, append uh, nil right neutral. Right, so this is a theorem that states that if you append um, an empty list to a list, then the um, result is the original list. And we can apply that to RevWise. Uh, hmm. Right, and now you can see that both sides of the goal are the same. So we can just use the trivial tactic to remove that. Um, and we now have the second uh, induction case goal. So again, we use intros to move the uh, induction hypothesis and the variables uh, into the context. We use compute to simplify it the expression. Um, we use another theorem provided in the standard library to rewrite the expression. Um, no, sorry, it's the uh, induction hypothesis next. So we rewrite um, with symmetry using the uh, induction hypothesis. And now you can see that the, um, the goal is almost the same on both sides. There's just these brackets. So uh, we can use an associativity theorem to rewrite that expression. Uh, rewrite append associative, yep, applied to revwise, rev, 
L0 and T0 and uh, trivial. And there's no more goals. Um, QED, we exit proof mode. Add proof, quit, and uh, oops. Now you can see that this proof has been added to our source file. So uh, in some cases, it's um, not only possible but feasible to prove the correctness of your code. Um, if you're working in you know very crucial code that it, if it doesn't work, then like people are going to die or like spaceships are going to blow up or something. Um, this is something you might consider doing as well. So some resources. Um, right, so there's the quick check paper from 2000, the original paper by Klassen and Hughes, um, which kind of justifies and explains the mechanisms that make quick check work in Haskell. Uh, a blog post by Tony Morris about automated unit testing Java code using Scala check. Um, this is actually a really good post because it talks about some of the principled reasons why this sort of testing is good. Um, so things like how it um, moves the developer to formulating their tests uh, in a way that involves the formation of the logical theorem, um, which Tony asserts is an essential part of what we do as programmers. Um, there's a UC San Diego lecture, which is a great introduction to QuickCheck. Um, again, the URL is up there. Uh, a talk by my mate Dave Lang on QuickCheck Beyond the Basics, which, which talks about some of the gotchas um, in QuickCheck and how to work around them. And uh, finally, if you're interested in learning Haskell, then um, Bite My Apps um, Haskell Learning Path is a great resource. So thanks for listening. We have time for questions, two. More than two questions. Yes. Um, how, how scalable is this this property type thing? I mean, if you're looking to test, say, user input, you know, validation or um, transform uh, for for you know data storage and things like that, um, how does how do you deal with the, all the the properties? <coughs> yeah. So there's. Um there's a, there's a follow-up paper to the original QuickCheck paper, <clears throat> and I'm speaking specifically about QuickCheck here. I'm, I'm not sure what the situation is for other languages, um, but there is a follow-up paper that talks about how to use QuickCheck to test effectful code. So that's the sort of things that you're talking about, code where you're interacting with um, the real world you know, using I.O. or interacting with a database and you're expecting to... Um, have uh, assertions about the, the state of um, the world outside this pure code um, at the start of the test and uh, at various stages throughout a computation and then at the end. So I'd recommend that resource and I'm sure there's plenty of blog posts and, and whatnot as well. Okay, um, and what about for um, even just say a, a validation stage where it might be quite complex and if you're looking at traditional unit testing you know, you might need dozens of specific tests to, to check, you know, all of the, the edge cases that you think might be in there. Mm -hmm. um, does property testing have a... Um, uh, is that something that works well in that case? Well, it just depends on what you're testing. So there'll, there'll be a number of properties um, that apply to, to what you're doing, to a particular algorithm or to a particular unit of functionality. So as a, like we looked at the list um, reverse example where there are, um, along with the type, exactly two properties that uniquely characterize that. Well, if you're gonna look at a queue, there's actually six properties for a queue. And so kind of the more complex the data structure, um, the more uh, properties there may be. But then it's quite surprising um, how few properties there are for some fairly elaborate data structures. Okay. So there's, there's actually kind of a, a third way of, of viewing, dealing with, with random uh, test data for, for testing, and that's the, um, 
There, there is some bug in the program, and the goal of the testing is a randomized search to find it, right? So you start off with some set of randomized data, and then through a set of, of rules, probably also applied randomly, mutate that data and continue to iterate over your, your test set until you, you find the bugs or give up because you've spent, you know, a day generating test data. Um, I had done a similar presentation to this uh, at the X Developer Summit last year, and that was the, the approach that, that I took for, for the case I was using. And it okay. is, is very similar, but, but kind of not really the flip side of the coin, maybe the, the edge side of the, of the same coin. Sure. So is that talking, talking about something like having kind of some known good data that you start with and then starting to, um, to mutate that in particular ways? Or yeah, so, because it, so, it sounds like it, it's kind of random, um, but there's some known starting point where you would begin with those tests. Right. So in, in the case that I, that I was testing, I was um, testing that a, a compiler was generating data structure layouts that adhered to a particular AB, ABI. So I would generate some random data structures and then gradually generate more and more random data structures that move move things around or increase the, the nesting of data structures and did different things. And then when it would find, the, the test cases would kind of gradually grow until you had these you know, several thousand line data structures. And then it would find a bug and it would apply a different set of rules to then gradually trim stuff out of the, the data structure until you had a minimal reproducing test case. Because looking at, here's a data structure that has 400 levels of nesting and is a thousand lines long. Ah, where do I even look for that bug? But then go through and trim it down to here's 12 lines and now it's easy. Yep, right. And so that's the purpose of the shrink function here, which I didn't talk about at all because it's a little bit more advanced. Um, but what shrink is designed to do is basically you, you have a um, counterexample that QuickCheck has found. So shrink is just... Um, designed to let the programmer um, give the tool some heuristics on how to reduce the complexity of a data structure. Um, but th there's not a lot of smarts in the current implementation of Shrink in QuickCheck. It's just like, here's some more examples that may or may not fail. If you find a simpler example that fails, go with that and try and simplify it again. And uh, eventually, it can't simplify it anymore, and it declares that that is a minimal counterexample. Cool. That probably sounds good. We're about done for questions, unless someone has a question that results in a 10-second answer. How does the theorem proving with interest compare with something like Coq? Uh, quite, quite similar, but syntactically they're quite different. Um, but I um, first began exploring um, proofs and certified programming in Coq. Um, I actually learned some Idris because I felt that with the syntax being similar to Haskell, it would be a bit more accessible to show you guys. But yeah, I'm, I'm actually quite a bit more familiar with Coq than with Idris. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much.